Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for what we know will be an important hour of solid, factual information and guidance to keep us all safe. As we all know, the Delta variant of COVID-19 is posing a very real threat to the health and safety of Middle Tennessee and the entire nation. Tonight, all four Nashville television stations have joined together to make sure that whatever news outlet you're watching right now gives you the most current and correct information as we go forward in this second wave of a public health crisis. We have four experts joining us tonight. First, Dr. Alex Jahangir, the chair of the Metro Nashville COVID Task Force, someone we've become very familiar with. Dr. Chris Ream is a pediatrician and also associate chief medical officer at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Another familiar face, Dr. James Hildreth, president and CEO of Meharry Medical College, and Catherine Sherman, who is in the front lines as an ICU COVID nurse. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us tonight. And Dr. Jahangir, I'm gonna start with you a little COVID-101. We remember and know that it's an airborne virus. What does that really mean? Really, um, what, what this means is that this disease spreads through the air. So whether you're in areas that are not, um, that are not very well, well ventilated, um, we're close to each other, this virus literally spreads through um, everyday breathing and, and speaking. And, and so it's very easy to transmit because of that. Dr. Reem, so many people are like, well, it must be just like the flu. We encounter that every year. How's it different? Sure, no, I think that's a great question. And I think um, in so many ways it is, it is different there. Um, it's, a, it's a novel virus, and so we, um, we the, the, the general population, don't have uh, a lot of immunity. We haven't been exposed to this virus in the past. And so it's able to, um, to infect all of us. Um, you know, when you think back to the, to the beginning of the pandemic, we, we were all, it, it was new to all of us. Dr. Hildreth, we say that there's a new variant. What does that mean? Has this thing literally changed its structure or what it does to us? Uh, that's exactly what it means. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19, is an RNA virus. They're all programmed to mutate. They change their gen genomes. So that changes the structure of the proteins, which it makes it more challenging for our our immune system to recognize it. So the variants are actually mutants of the virus. Did we know that was going to happen? Yes, we did. And how does that change the way we react? Well, it puts some urgency in all of us getting vaccinated because if all of us are vaccinated, it takes away the opportunity for the virus to infect us and to mutate. So it makes variants less likely if all of us are vaccinated. Catherine, as we said, you're with patients now on a daily basis. How many people are you taking care of? And give us an idea of what you're dealing with every day. Um, so I care for anywhere between one to three patients at a time, given staffing needs and how critically ill the patient is. They're all on ventilators. They're all on ventilators. Most of them are prone, um, which is when we flip them onto their bellies to try and give their lungs a better chance to expand. They are kind of stuck in the by medications, by the ventilator, by dialysis machines. Um, it's, it's pretty brutal to watch, honestly. Dr. Jahangir, we're talking about Delta being more contagious. How much more contagious? So when, when this virus first came in March of 2020, if I was infected, I would on average spread this uh, virus through to two other people. Through the mutant, uh, mutations that have happened, one now, if one person is infected, it can spread to six other people. It's so much more easily transmitted. It gets picked up by the lungs more quickly. Um, and, and so it's, it's now the equivalence of, of measles and chickenpox and, and just such an easily spreadable disease compared to where it was um, just 18 months ago. Dr. Reem, we never had so much uh, mistrust or distrust about measles or chicken pox. We accepted that it was a childhood disease or a spreadable disease. Um, what's different now? You know, I think the world is just a little bit of a different place. I think that um, we all have so much information kind of at our fingertips with social media or with other, um, with other ways to share information. And I think, um, often those platforms can share information that sort of leads you down a path that, um, that, that may, may not always be the most, the most accurate information. 
Compare Vanderbilt Children's last spring to what you're seeing today. It's a vastly different place. Um, I think in the first, the first round, we in, um, in children's hospitals here in, in Nashville and across the nation were really spared um, of COVID infected children and then also other uh, typical you know, viruses or other typical things that we would see. And um, this summer has been quite the opposite. We are incredibly busy with both um, COVID infected children as well as we have a much uh, larger population of kind of typical summer viruses. We'll often see uh, enteroviruses and, 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 and this one type of virus in, in the summer. And we're also having kind of normal winter viruses um, on top. So pediatricians across the nation are, are swamped and, and that is true in Middle Tennessee as well. What did you all think as physicians when you heard early on, oh, this is something that probably won't affect children in a big way? Dr. Hildreth, I can see the look on your face. Uh, I, for one, was offended by anyone who would say this is not going to affect children because children are not immune to viruses. They get infected by viruses just like adults do. And any human being with a protein called angiotensin converting enzyme number two can be infected by the virus, whether they're two months old or 102 years old. So we always knew that children could be infected, but they get less disease than adults do, but they could be infected. Are there any children in your ICU, Catherine? Our ICU is adults only. I know that there are some kids with um, COVID on our pediatric medical surgical unit. Let's talk a little bit about getting COVID again. Some of these people think, well, I've had it. Um, the test came out positive. I had some symptoms. It's over for me and then I've gotten vaccinated, I can't get sick again. Not true? It's, it's, it is true that um, people who are fully vaccinated, um, some people have what we call breakthrough cases, okay? But let me put it in perspective for you. Here in Nashville, 360,000 people have been fully vaccinated. So over 52% of our population. Out of that 360,000, we now have slightly less than 3,400 who have a bro breakthrough case, so less than 1%. And of those people who have, who have breakthrough cases, a high 99.8% do really well. They, they may have some, a head cold, they may have some, just some symptoms, but they don't die, they don't get hospitalized. And so I think people who say, oh look, the vaccine doesn't work because literally less than 1% of people got a breakthrough case from what is now a super, super um, easily transmittable disease is, is wrong. I like to kind of put this analogy to it. The vaccine, it's like you have a really dry bush. And the vaccine, you, you get it super wet. And so the risk of a fire now, if, because it's super wet, is very low. Mm -hmm. You can still get a little bit of a brush fire, but it's wet, it's not gonna spread. It's not gonna destroy a whole community. But if you're not vaccinated, you're gonna have that dry brush and it's gonna quickly spread and it's gonna destroy lives and it's gonna destroy um, property. And, and that's what I think the difference between being vaccinated and unvaccinated is now. And you were telling me, uh, Dr. Jahangir, that earlier, the people who were vaccinated earlier in this entire scenario are the ones that perhaps immunity is waning a little bit? Yeah, and this is what I'm seeing both um, personally, and I think now you're, you're starting to see um, the FDA committee looking at this, CDC committee is looking at this. Um, around, so I was one of the first people in Nashville to get vaccinated when healthcare workers became vaccinated. I was fully vaccinated on January 8th. Mm. So some of my colleagues who were vaccinated around the same time, I'm starting to see, are starting to have these breakthrough cases. Again, they don't get super sick, but they are starting to see this. So that's why there's discussions right now. In fact, the committee just met, um, I believe Monday, and they're meeting again later this week or early next week to make recommendations to have a booster shot for those who um, ha received vaccinations eight months prior. Um, it should be noted that third dose is now available for those who are immune compromised because one's immune people who are immune comp compromised don't have the necessarily the full immunity that I or others may have. But but it is looking more and more as if a um, booster shot may be warranted for certain people, and and those people typically are at the eight, six to eight month phase. And and but that's okay. We do that for the flu. Uh, when you had the hepatitis C vaccine, you had three doses, and then you didn't need it anymore. The HPV vaccine. There's many vaccines out there that you have to take multiple doses prior to getting full immunity. I was going to say, Dr. Hildreth, um, 
these things are in development. This is a novel, brand new virus. It's a brand new vaccine. We should expect that adjustments were, will be made down the line in terms of the dose you need. I mean, to an earlier point, prior to November of 2019, as far as we know, no humans had ever been exposed to this, which means that all of us were immunologically naive to it. So when you get infected by the virus, you're in an essence but what we call a primary immune response. The real magic happens the next time you get exposed to it, you make a secondary immune response. And that's why the vaccine, some of them have a two-shot design to make sure you have that secondary response. So it's not a surprise that the immunity is waning, uh, but I want people to remember, we're all excited about the possibility of having a vaccine with 50% efficacy. Imagine having three vaccines that do what they do. It's just, it's remarkable. It really is. Catherine, how many people in your ICU were prior vaccinated? Zero. 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 And the family members of those people who are going through the trauma of seeing their loved one struggle so, are they going out and getting vaccinated for the most part? Some of them are. Some of them aren't. Some people will cling to the idea that COVID is all a hoax until their very last breath and I don't know how to reach those people. We hear so often that the hospitals are being taxed um, and are full to the max, and tomorrow there could be a car accident, tonight someone unfortunately could have a heart attack. I mean, how do you administratively deal with that? Dr. Reem? Yes, no, it is. It's really, it's really tough when, when you're at capacity and, um, and resources are, are stretched and are limited. And, and we're all working incredibly hard to care for every patient that comes through the doors. I know that hospitals in outlying communities have an even harder time because it's harder to find a, a hospital to transfer a patient into if you have that heart attack and you present to a, to a community hospital where they may not be able to, to do that open heart surgery or that sort of thing. And I think that's one of the hardest, the hardest um, parts to deal with for us in this uh, super, um, specialized environment at Vanderbilt is that we, we need to be able to take those children who need to have an operation right away or, um, or children who have other underlying diseases that make them, that make them vulnerable. And it's really tough. And, can, and I want to add something onto that. Um, you know, at the end of our last surge in, um, in December, um, we started having similar problems. And, and what I'm really proud of is that is the big hospital systems here in Nashville came together and did what is frankly one of the few examples in the country, and definitely the first in the state, of developing protocols so that people who get sick in Middle Tennessee from anything, not just COVID, have the ability to stay within Middle Tennessee and not have to be shipped to Virginia or Minnesota or Iowa. Mm. Um, very fortunately, at the, by the time this protocol came together last December or January, we didn't have to use it. But we've now implemented that again. And just last week, over 75 patients who would have otherwise, they're from these, these small rural communities and would have been shipped to gosh knows where, right? Stayed in Middle Tennessee. And the fact that 75 people, there literally was no hospital to transfer and, the, um, and gosh, I don't know what would have happened to them, right? And, and so we gotta really, these are real people's lives and it's not just COVID, it's heart attacks, it's strokes, it's traumas. Um, if it wasn't for our great health systems in this region, I think we'd be much worse off than we are. And so people need to realize that this is not lip service. This is really happening every day, 75 people just last week. And we're not seeing people go in and then quickly leave the hospital. No. Long, long hospitalizations. Weeks. What have you seen, Catherine? Uh, weeks. We, the, our patients that are on the ventilator with COVID, I mean, I think the average right now is something like three weeks. And I don't, you know, I became a nurse during COVID. This is my normal. But my understanding is that prior to COVID, the average ICU stay was something like, three to four days. I might be wrong about that, but it, it was definitely a fraction of what it is now. So not only are these beds being taken up, they are being taken up for extended periods of time by patients who are critically ill and require extremely close nursing care. Is there adequate staff to take care of all these people? I think that's one of our challenges. If I'm not that was a very tactful answer. I think people are tired. <laughs> Healthcare yes. workers are tired. They're tired of the work. I mean, what Catherine sees every day, I don't, I don't think you can, one can fully appreciate what she and her colleagues see. I mean, you know, as a physician, you can go and you take care of people and then you have the ability to step away for a little bit. Nurses 
don't. Exactly. And you, see, and you see people get exhausted, and you see people get tired of being um, bullied. I mean, I think we can't lose track of, of what's happening in our society to healthcare workers. Um, and, and you see people going to other opportunities, and, and it's, it's in the ICUs, but it's in the operating rooms, it's, it's in the ERs, it's in our testing centers. This is, this is really an impact um, across healthcare, and, and I, I don't think one can um, not think about that. And, and again, what, what Catherine has done for over a year now is, is pretty remarkable. Dr. Hildreth, you're educating new physicians every day. Um, are people anxious about going out into the field? Uh, I wouldn't say they're anxious. I think some of the students are excited to be in medicine at a time when medicine has had to step to the forefront and literally save, save the world, actually. But I want to make a point about something I witnessed a few weeks ago when a pediatrician was accosted at a, bo at a board meeting. And it occurred to me that pediatrician will treat that person's child if they get COVID, whether that person had accosted them or not. So thank goodness for the grace on the part of healthcare workers. I mean, we got to stop fighting each other and start fighting the virus. That's what we need to do. Let's talk a little bit about the variety of vaccinations that are out there. Um, is there one better than another? <laughs> no, there's not. Whatever vaccine that one can take, one should take that vaccine because all of them went to a rigorous uh, trial to make sure they were safe. They went to a rigorous uh, trial to make sure they were effective. And keep in mind that scientists were praying for a vaccine with 50% efficacy. And as I said earlier, we have three that, as far as we know, if you get those vaccines, your chances of being hospitalized or dying from COVID are reduced drastically. And what I want people to know is that when you get vaccinated, it's both a selfish thing to do because you're protecting yourself. It's also a selfless thing to do because you're protecting the whole community. That's one of the most important things about being vaccinated. But it is true that only Pfizer is at present approved for children, right? Correct. That is and correct. And why is that? Just it was there first? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, the, uh, to Dr. Hildreth's point, I think that they, all the vaccines have to go through different, um, different testing procedures to, to, to guarantee their safety before, before allowing them to be given to children. And the other vaccines are also going through, through the same safety protocols to, um, to bring that age down. Um, and so we're super grateful that Pfizer it has been able to be approved down to the age of 12. And, um, and we're looking forward to having, having additional options for children as well. It is really important. I wanted to say, as Alex, as you were talking about the difference of, of patients um, who are vaccinated and unvaccinated, that that's the same pattern that we're seeing in, in children in children's hospitals. So those children who are eligible to be vaccinated, who are 12 and older, are not being admitted to the hospital. And so we're seeing very similar patterns. Um, that the vaccine works really, really well at what it's supposed to do, which is to keep you um, in school and, and um, active in, in your communities, not sick and in the hospital. And I'd like to clear up a misconception that some people seem to have a vac vac Vaccines do not create a shield around you to keep the virus from infecting you. What vaccines are designed to do is to make sure your immune system can quickly respond and keep the virus from taking hold in your body. So breakthrough infections are not surprising, but they're doing exactly, the vaccines are doing exactly what we hoped them to do, as Dr. Jahanger explained earlier. So people need to know that the vaccine is not some magic shield to keep the viruses away from you. You may get an infection, but you won't get really sick or die from it. I know we've all been vaccinated. Go ahead, Kathy. I was going to say my favorite analogy that I ever heard about vaccines is that uh, the vaccination is like a dress rehearsal so that when your body actually encounters the pathogen, that's, that's the actual opening night. Exactly. The immune, um, the vaccine just prepares your immune system for that opening night. It's exactly. a practice run. We've all had probably different experiences post-vaccine here. Um, I had a real sore arm after the first dose. And after the second dose, I had a one day where I felt pretty crummy. But then the next day it was almost miraculous. I thought I was back completely back to normal. Everyone else have sort of similar, or I've heard a lot of people that had absolutely 
zero effects. Well, well I'll tell you, I, I don't think I've ever told many people, but yeah, this, the second dose of the vaccine kind of kicked my rear a little bit. <laughs> but you know what? It, it was exactly as like you said. It was one day. It was, I had some, some shakes. I was tired, muscle aches. And it was one day. But, I, but in my deep down, I knew what that was telling me is my body recognized it was, it was a dress rehearsal. It was doing what it needed to be doing. I was actually really happy about it, you know, and, and I prepared myself. I, I planned my, the next day after my vaccine to, to not have anything going on. I took some Tylenol. It was fine. And so I think that is really important to know that some, but I also know many other people that um, didn't have anything. They just had a little sore arm and that's great too. So it, there can be that, but that doesn't, I'd rather have one day of chills <sighs> than laying on my belly um, with Catherine doing the things that she and her colleagues <laughs> yeah. do you don't want um, with the ventilator. And, yeah. and, and that's, that's really critical. And the thought went through my mind, being a non-medical person, that if this is making me feel bad from a tiny bit of exposure, imagine if it had taken hold of my body. I mean, it has to give you pause. Absolutely. Well, it's yeah. important to know that you cannot get infected from the vaccine. Oh, correct, yeah. Right? But some of the side effects that people are experiencing, as Alex, Dr. Hanger said, they reflect the fact that your immune system has been awakened. And some of those side effects just reflect the fact that your immune system has been activated. So it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. I took it as a good sign. When I felt, you know, pretty bad after my second, my second dose, I was like, yes, like, get ready. <laughs> you know, it's so much better to have that than to actually encounter the illness and have all of the risks that come with actually contracting that disease. I know there are scientific reasons why J&J &J is only one shot, but no one should think that it's only one shot, therefore it's only half the protection. Oh, no. No, no. So all of these vaccines get evaluated in animal models first, just to make sure there's immunogenicity and you can get an immune response. And then you take those animal studies and you design as a study to do in humans to make sure you get the same kind of response in, in humans. So the J&J &J vaccine went through a rigorous evaluation to make sure that the single shot did exactly what the FDA was hoping for. Keep in mind that that was the ideal vaccine in most people's mind, a single shot stored in a refrigerator, stored in a freezer for months, and J&J &J delivered exactly what they were asked to do. Here in Tennessee, though, we have one of the lowest rates of vaccination in the country. Why? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult question to answer. Uh, I think a lot of it comes back to what Dr. Reem was talking about with misinformation. And because COVID is so new, a lot of people don't know where to look for information. And when you don't know where to look, it comes from everywhere. Um, you know, even people who are highly educated, very smart people are susceptible to this disinformation, especially if they don't have a medical background. You know, it, it comes from distrust of the government. It comes from distrust of these larger systems. And it comes from these coordinated campaigns of misinformation from different actors. And it, it has a real impact on people's lives. It's not, it's not a game. It kills people. And if I could build on that, um, and, and I completely agree. I, I think the key here now, though, is, is early on, we, we got the, the people who were going to get the vaccine very easily. We got there. I think the onus now is on people at the very local level to, to provide people with the right information. I had a, a friend. So I'm, you know, I mean, obviously, I've, I've been on TV and given a lot of talks about why we should do vaccines. I've reached all the people who are going to do that. But, but I had a friend who called me um, and, and he said, um, this guy I hadn't talked to in about a year, and he said, you know, I, I have all these questions about vaccines, but I've reached a point now where I, I, there's half my friends I speak with and they'll make fun of me because I haven't been vaccinated. There's half that I won't speak with, but, they, but when I speak with them, they make, they're mad at me because I'm thinking about getting vaccinated. So I didn't have anyone to turn to. So he called me as a friend forget any formal role I had, somebody who's obviously somewhat knowledgeable, and we talked it through. And just a, a week ago, he texted me and, and told me he got his first shot. Um, patients of mine, you know, I, I'm a practicing physician. I now am able to get to them because there's that trust. And so I think what we need is, is really leadership. And leadership doesn't come from a job in isolation, right? Leadership comes from each of us going to our neighbor, neighbors, our friends, um, your pastors, your community organizers, your, your doctors. Um, your nurse practitioners, your PAs, um, your local reporters. 
and, and people who you know and have that conversation. And then, and then find the right source of information. I found um, the Ad Council actually has done a really great um, job compiling unbiased information. There's a website called getvaccineanswers.org. You can getvaccineanswers.org. And I found that to be a really great website. It compiles all these other places of information and gives you the source of where you get, and it allows you to get some answers. So I, I think I agree the misinformation is really causing a problem. Lack of leadership, frankly, has caused a problem. But all of us can be leaders, and all of us can now get information easily. Just make sure the source is, is a good one. Dr. Hildreth, you were on every day, <laughs> explaining everything to us. <laughs> well, uh, but I want to emphasize points that were made by my colleagues. Trust is so important here. We need people who are trusted to engage the people who are trust them to deliver the message. But we can't get around the fact that in our country right now, politics and science have been conflated. And, you know, let me just say this and get it out of my system. We need leaders to lead and leave the science to scientists. In fact, scientists will make a deal with the politicians. If you leave the science to the scientists, we'll leave the polit politics to you all. That's, that's the deal we're going to put on the table. Okay? Um, Sorry, I just had to get that out of my system. I think we all feel that way. That's been very frustrating to watch as, you know, someone who is knee deep in COVID every day to see politicians and, you know, political actors who have no medical, no science background making either statements or rulings um, about COVID when they clearly do not have the knowledge to do so. And it's, it's very, very frustrating to feel like our efforts to keep people alive and to keep people safe are being blocked by people who don't know what they're talking about. Well, let's bust a few myths about <laughs> side effects and what the vaccine might do to you, et cetera, et cetera. We've heard some things that just seem hard to comprehend, but I've heard a lot of women of childbearing age who are extremely nervous about taking anything um, you know, so even over-the-counter drugs. What about a COVID vaccine? You know, the um, American College of OBGYNs and the Society for um, Maternal Fetal Medicine, it's a two very well-trusted organizations who, who entire profession revolves around the health of a baby and, and, um, the, and the mother, um, have both come out and said pregnant women and people thinking of getting pregnant should get the vaccine. vaccine. Not should consider it, but should get the vaccine. Um, and I also think the, the misconceptions around um, the vaccines going to make one infertile, look at your source. That source came from a great blogger out of Europe who wrote a letter essentially making stuff up to um, the equivalent of the FDA in Europe and got a lot of play. But the scientists, the American College of OBGYN, Society of Fetal, Fetal and Maternal Medicine, people who... I, my wife and I trusted to, for their guidance when we were having our children have, have looked at this and, and they've really come out very strongly just within the past month. Dr. So, Reem, if there's one myth that you could bust right now, which one? Yes, you know, the, you have hit on some of the ones that I was really <laughs> thinking about it. Our vaccine rates amongst um, expectant moms is, is even lower than the state average, uh, about half of the state average at about 25%. And so I really do think it's so important to protect um, to protect expectant moms and their babies. Um, and, and just because, because the pediatric population, um, the, the fear of infertility and that, that, that myth that, that you're just mentioning um, was so prevalent, I think it's so important to talk about that because, because it's, it's never been proven scientifically and I feel, I feel so um, that the vaccine is so important in, in, our, in, our younger, in our younger patients. So thank you for bringing up both of those. Dr. Hilder, when there was a pause with the J&J, &J, um, what came of that? And is that a, a sort of a solved issue now? Yes, uh, I think you're referring to the, the myocarditis or the inflammation around the heart that was caused. We now know that if you look at the data in total, the, the rate of those occurrences in vaccine recipients are really no different than in general population now that we have enough data to look at. And it's very rare. And uh, the likelihood of getting that versus getting really seriously sick from COVID-19 makes it a no-brainer that the vaccine should win every time. 
And one of the myths that I want to mm -hmm. bust while we're musting, busting myths <laughs> is the one about microchips and the vaccines that are going to follow people around. So in the mRNA vaccines, here's what's in the vial. There's the mRNA, there's some lipids, there are sugar, sucrose, there's water, and a little bit of acid to adjust the pH. That's all that's in there. No heavy metals, no microchips, no preservatives. That's all that's in the vial. If you're worried about chips, put your phone away and leave it at home. And those are all those ingredients that he just listed. Those are all things our bodies produce naturally, and those are all things that are broken. Your body is constantly producing and breaking down mRNA. mRNA just means messenger DNA. You know, that, that is something that your body makes all the time and is always breaking down. So there, there's nothing in the vaccine that is going to be capable of tracking you or, you know, changing your DNA or any of those things that people fixate on. We're going to take a little break and be back with our conversation in just a moment. Thanks for staying with us. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. If you're just tuning in, we've got four of the top experts in Nashville on COVID-19. And thank you very much for being with us. Let me reintroduce the panel if I could. Dr. Alex Jahangir, the chair of the Metro Nashville COVID Task Force. Dr. Chris Reem, who is Chief Associate Chief Medical Officer at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital, also a pediatrician. Uh, Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College. And Catherine Sherman, who is a COVID ICU nurse and is dealing with patients every day. Let's talk a little bit about treatments for COVID, both the established and accepted and the ones that are not working. Uh, what should we stay away from? If, you, if someone says, hey, this is what you need to do. So, so here's what, what we ha have been shown to work, right? Um, for most people, if you're, if you're oxygenating well and you're doing well, rest, fluids, things you do for, for normal diseases. If you are, however, um, over 40 and you've tested positive and you have other symptoms, monoclonal antibodies are available in our region. And, and what those are, if you get them within the first week or so, it can really make you not have the bad symptoms um, that, that some people will have. And, and each of our health systems will have access to that. Is that a natural product? Is it no. a drug? Um, what is so it? it's, it's a great, actually the history of monoclonal antibodies is, is, actually has a Nashville connection here at Vanderbilt. Um, uh, one, of, one of our um, great colleagues um, did one of the studies around it. And, and it's actually still under an emer emergency use authorization. So similar to um, the Moderna and J&J &J vaccines, but it really can save lives. That's the treatment you should, you should get. And more importantly, you should consult your healthcare provider. Right. Consult your, your physicians, your nurse practitioners, your, your PA, whomever you trust, that is who should be guiding you. What you shouldn't be doing <laughs> is taking ivermectin, which is a horse anti-parasite medicine. Think about it. It's, it's a horse medicine that, that literally kills parasites. And, and within the past um, month or so, we have seen a five-fold increase to calls to the Poison Control Center. We have seen, a eight, um, we've seen a four times increase in people hospitalized for it, and 8% of those people have been put in the ICU. This stuff can kill you. It can, knocks out your kidneys. You may have to get dialysis. Mm. Like, this is not a joke. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I cannot say this more strongly. I don't take my dog's flea medicine, right? <laughs> There's a reason I don't, and, and, and it's because... That's for my dog, I, and I don't have fleas. Uh, but, but, but I think I, I, I need people to please listen. This, there, there's, there, listen to how things happen. It goes to the misinformation. Um, there are treatments out there um, to treat people once you get infected. Best thing you can do is get vaccinated. Um, but please, please don't take the horse parasite. <laughs> Dr. Reem, are children potentially getting this? Um, you know, that's a great question. Luckily, I have not heard of any parents giving their children ivermectin, and I think uh, uh, that doesn't mean they haven't. They prob probably somebody has somewhere. I hope, I hope not. I think parents are usually a little bit more skeptical of things like that for children as compared to, as compared to maybe some of their adult, or, or adult my adult colleagues. 
Um, but certainly, I think that there, um, that that the vaccine is the is the is the most important thing that we can do to keep kids healthy and safe. We need to vaccinate everyone around uh, them because, unfortunately, you know, a large percentage of my patients are not eligible for vaccination quite yet. You know, anyone less than the age of 12, and so we need to do everything we can by protecting everyone, everyone around them using vaccination and other techniques that we know work like masking and, and distancing um, and, and staying home when you're not well. Let's reinforce again why children under 12 are not yet authorized. Is it just still something that we don't have enough information on and we wanna be absolutely certain before we inject the kids? Exactly. I, th I think that it's it's the way everything works in pediatrics. To be yes. quite honest, that that we generally wait. Well, it takes us a little bit longer. We we get through approval processes for adults first, and then and then kids second. And, and we just have to be careful. And so hopefully, in the next couple of months, two to three months, the the vaccine will be uh, licensed for the next age group down, and we'll just kind of go down, you know, kind of by increments. And and so hopefully, it will be it will be soon. Um, but we're just not quite there yet. So until we get there. We need to do everything we can to, to help protect the children of our community. Dr. Hildreth, early on we heard the word hydroxychloroquine, which is a legitimate medicine for some conditions, mm -hmm. just not COVID. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence whatsoever that hydroxychloroquine should have ever been tried for COVID-19. It has no antiviral activities that we know of, and I don't know how that got started, but to Alex's point, the drugs that are available go through a rigorous scientific evaluation to make sure they're safe and effective. And that was not done. It has been done and it's been confirmed that hydroxychloroquine does not work for COVID-19. There have been two large studies that I'm aware of. So the, the jury is out and it doesn't work. But, but to my colleague's point, there's no way that you should be taking a medicine designed to eliminate parasites from horses for COVID-19. There's just no, <laughs> people just shouldn't do it. It's just not a wise thing to do. A lot of people think they can tough things out at home. Oh, yeah, How yeah. do you know when you're sick enough to go to a hospital, which we know every bed is precious at this point? I mean, are there some general guidelines if people are starting to not feel better and they kind of know they're infected? So, um, you know, I often tell people, and early in this pandemic, I bought a pulse oximeter which yes. is a little thing that checks your oxygen level. You can buy them for like 20 bucks, give or take. Um, and, you know, so, th so there's a couple of things, right? I, mean, I, I think one, one is the pulse oximeter. If you put it on and your ability to keep your oxygenation level, let's say, ab um, below, above the mid-90 range, you probably should talk to your healthcare provider. Um, if you're having a fever um, that is really uncontrollable, go to your healthcare provider. If you're just feeling really lousy, go to your healthcare provider. We're all here to help. Like that's literally what we spent a decades of our lives to tr to do. And and no one, no hospital or healthcare provider will turn their back on you. We never have. We never will. But you have to trust the people who've literally have dedicated decades of their lives to do this. But but so I think don't don't take um, you know symptoms that worry you. Um, just forget about them. Go talk to someone. Um, but really, oxygenization, high fever, you're just feeling really lousy. If you have an underlying medical condition, um, obesity, okay? Mm. A third of our state is obese, meaning um, overweight. Obesity has been directly linked with both adults and children to cause you to be more likely to be hospitalized. So if you're a little overweight and you got COVID, don't blow off symptoms. Uh, it really can be a harbinger of something really bad about to happen. Exactly. Catherine, how sick do you see people coming in? They're, they're coming in a lot sicker this time, it seems like. Um, by the time they come to the ICU, they are either on um, a BiPAP, which is a, a mask that goes over your face and it forces air down into your lungs. Um, and when they come to us on the BiPAP, they are almost always intubated within a day or two. But at this point, most of them are coming to us and either being intubated right away or they're already on the ventilator. Last time it wasn't like that. Last time they were coming to the ICU on um, what's called a high flow nasal cannula and they would be on that for a couple days and then you know, um, progress to the BiPAP and then to the ventilator. It seems like we're just skipping that step. It seems like people are getting much sicker much more quickly this time. Does that speak to the uh, contagion or the virulence of it or a combination of everything? 
Well, there are some biological properties of the virus that might explain it. For one thing, viruses are incomplete life forms. They have to get inside of cells to replicate, and they do that by binding to a receptor. The spike protein of Delta binds much more tightly to its receptor, which means it takes fewer particles to cause an infection. And as Dr. Jahanger said, there's more of that virus in your nasal cavity to begin with, which makes it more likely you're going to transmit it. So we think that some of those biological properties may account for the fact that it's making people sicker quicker. It's a, it's a much more worrisome virus than ones we started with. And, and I think, if I may add a little bit more to that, the other thing is the same people who are not getting the vaccine for many different reasons are the same people who are getting sicker. So it could be these people get sick, get the virus, and rather than early on, do again, talk to their healthcare provider or maybe get monoclonal antibodies, they'll blow it off because COVID's not a hoax. COVID causes real problems. Mm -hmm. And so part of it also could be people are coming in later too because they, they think it's not as serious as it is. This, this can be serious. Talk to healthcare providers when you get it and get some direction on what you need to do. We're living with this as it develops. We don't know how long it could stay with you, whether it will always stay with you, whether we'll need vaccines every year. We're learning as we go, aren't we? But one thing we do know, the sooner all of us get vaccinated, the less likely it is we'll be dealing with this for more years, right? Because if we don't deal with it, there'll be other variants that we'll have to deal with one after the other. Because we've had alpha, beta, now delta, there's an epsilon on the way, lambda's already here. There are two that were just discovered in South Africa. So the sooner all of us do what we need to do and get vaccinated, the sooner we can put this behind us. It's as simple as that. Let's talk about masks. You know, that oh, was dear. our first line of defense. Do they <laughs> still work? Do we still need them? We all have ours in our pocket. We're socially distant right now, but I'm wearing mine everywhere. I'm fully vaccinated, but I have this with me everywhere I go because I realize that even being vaccinated, I can get infected and perhaps transmit the virus to someone who's not. So as far as I'm concerned, we should still be wearing masks just for everybody's protection. That's, that's the thing I think um, a lot of people didn't understand about masks the first time around. The surgical or cloth mask does not provide you, the wearer, all of that much protection. It's a little bit better than wearing nothing, but the, the real uh, goal of those masks is it stops you from spreading it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that only works if everyone is wearing them or if the vast majority of people are wearing them. So that wearing a mask is truly a very selfless thing that you can do if you care about your neighbors, if you care about your community. You, you can just wear a mask and that way if you have COVID and you don't know it, you are not risking spreading that to somebody who is maybe much more susceptible, higher risk, and would end up in the ICU. And the point that Dr. Jahanga made earlier bears repeating. SARS-CoV-2 is a truly airborne pathogen, which means that simply speaking to someone without yelling, coughing, or sneezing is sufficient to put enough virus in the air to transmit. There's, a, there's stories I've read, like one a couple of weeks ago. A guy goes into a restroom in a, in a restaurant, he doesn't know he has COVID. He's in there for a few minutes, he leaves. Someone else comes in 35 minutes later, the virus is still in the air, and he gets COVID from the person who was there 35 minutes earlier. But if that person had been wearing a mask, it's unlikely that would have happened. The point is, when a truly airborne pathogen is the challenge, these are among our best steps to protect ourselves. As we sit here tonight, we have at least, I believe, four or five school systems proximate to us where they just can't have classes right now. It's just impossible because so many kids are getting sick. Um, are we going to see a full-scale shutdown of all schools? I mean, is the potential there numerically? I'm sure. <laughs> you know, I hope not, right? I, I think... Um... I, I think the best place for children to learn is in person. I have three elementary school children myself, and Dr. Reem has some, some high school children, and, and, and it's really, I think being in person is, is um, important. But the most effective thing we have, if you can't get vaccinated, which none of my children can be vaccinated, is social distancing and masks. Yes. 
And you know what? Most kids are pretty cool with wearing a mask. They're fine with it. It's their parents who put the idea in their head that, hey, this, don't wear a mask. And if you look at um, metro schools, which um, does require masks, the incidence of cases per capita is lower than these other counties around us that don't require masks. Um, and a lot of transmission doesn't happen in the classroom. It's happening <laughs> on the sports field at the cafeteria, cafeteria the sleepovers. Um, you know, I, I think for me, my biggest angst right now is my, my children and, and other people's children. And so I, I, I think we can try to minimize some of that by making masks a, a normal part of school. Like, none of us enjoy wearing a mask, right? I mean, I've wear a mask years before the pandemic because of my day job. I don't enjoy wearing a mask, but it, it's what I did to protect my patients, and it's what I'm doing now to protect my neighbors, my kids, and kids do it to each other. I, I think masks in schools is the best way short of, of vaccinating children. If you're 12, and that's another thing, if, if there are 12 to 18-year-olds, the vaccination rate is still not... Um, right. on par with the national average. Really? So, yeah, so I think parents... And that's the parental decision-making. Yeah, there. and I think, I think we just need to all get comfortable. I've heard from, um, from people, they're worried about their young daughters, about the infertility question. They're worried. I mean, there's so many, so many things. What I worry about for my kids is what if one of my kids gets COVID and what's the long-term implications of COVID that. for that person? Mm -hmm. um, you hear about cardiac problems, you hear about lung problems, you hear about brain problems, like cognitively they're, they're just a little slower um, in processing. I don't know what that is, right? But uh, so for me, my risk benefit analysis, when my children are able to be vaccinated, I will vaccinate them because I believe that will protect them in the long term. And, and Dr. Reem with- uh, Yeah, so I thoughts. just thank you so much for saying everything that you just said, because I couldn't agree more. And I, and I feel the same way, I think that we, really want to encourage parents to to take their children to be vaccinated it's the it's the it's the greatest defense that we've got and it's really really safe and really really effective yeah and i want to emphasize what dr jahanger just said as a consequence of getting COVID 19 many people get something called long COVID. you've recovered but for as long as a couple of years based on sars in 2003 people have respiratory challenges they have brain fog, they have other kinds of things. Kids are not small adults. Their systems are still developing, all of them. In fact, some of the systems aren't fully developed until we're in our early 20s. We don't know whether long COVID will cause challenges in the development of a child who's still growing and developing. So that's why I believe we didn't do everything we can to keep COVID out of children. Everything we can, because we don't know. We just don't. So why take the chance? Another thing too, kind of thinking, thinking along those lines is that, um, that we have seen um, a little uptick in a, a disease called MISC. So there's a multi-inflammatory um, condition that can, can come after COVID infection. Mm. Um, in other countries, in, in, in England and Israel, where, where the Delta variant was present earlier, um, luckily, they didn't see a huge bump in the MISC rates, but um, but it is something to be to be to pay attention to as well. I think earlier when you guys were talking about why would you go to the hospital, why would you go to see your doctor, um, thinking thinking ab about those symptoms that can come a little bit after after the infection. So that's something that's important for parents to be keeping their eyes out for as well. Um, is this is this condition called MISC? We were talking about protective PPE. I'm wondering, Catherine, has your um, personal routine changed since the first wave? Not particularly. Um, we still wear a, a respirator. We wear a respirator, goggles, face shield, and um, either a plastic or a paper gown whenever we go into confirmed COVID rooms. Um, there are some nurses who wear an N95 their entire shift, whether they're going into a COVID room or not, um, because either they are at higher risk or because they have young kids who can't be vaccinated or they have you know, a, another loved one who's at higher risk. Um, so we're, we're still being very careful with our PPE. Um, you know, we're not experiencing the same shortage is issues that we were at the beginning of the pandemic, thankfully but it, it has not lightened up as far as our routines go. Here we are days away from a holiday weekend and I believe that the CDC is saying, if you don't have to travel, <laughs> please don't. We saw what happened in the first wave with spring breaks. Um, what are you all doing? Would you, would you get on a plane? Would you go to a big gathering at this point? 
No. Yeah. No. I wouldn't. Yeah. We're not, we're not planning on doing anything this holiday weekend, mm -hmm. but spending time together and spending time outside. I'm working. Yeah. So, how do you have the conversation with someone that is so resistant to getting a shot? You know, can, if I may jump on that initially, I, I think the one thing that is really, really um, important is before, we all need to put aside our biases when we, we approach somebody who, who is like that, right? For me, the very first thing is, is sincerely to, to ask why. Is it because they um, had a loved one who had a bad reaction and it worries them? Is it because they had a bad reaction themselves to another vaccine at some point? Is it because they um, are, are detorn because they, they see some of their friends really ostracizing those who get a vaccine? Or is it because they have this horrendous misinformation and, and this lack of individual thinking that has led them to this group think? I think you need to know why, right? Mm -hmm. as, a, as a physician, when I come across a patient, any this medical decision, that's how I start my conversations. And all of us can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but people will only have an honest discussion with you if they recognize they only, um, they only will um, care um, what you know once they know that you care. And, and I think that's really important um, to make them know that you do care and, and not be so judgmental. All of us have biases. All of us judge um, if we're not careful. And I think we all need to recognize that and we need to just put that aside and figure out why and then help that person get to um, what I think is the right decision of getting a vaccine and provide the information they need in a less judgmental opinion. And we've seen the heartbreak of some well-known people who have lost their lives to this vaccine and only after that do we get some of these people mm -hmm. taking to heart, hey, maybe I should do this for myself. Do you think um, the publicity in that regard is helping? I hope so. I mean, uh, but to Alex's point, a lot of this comes down to trust uh, that people have with the person who's having the conversation. I always acknowledge that the person has every reason to be hesitant because they're essentially healthy and we're giving them they're thinking of it as a medicine. Why do I need this medicine? I'm healthy. So you have to explain to them why we're doing this. And I think if you answer questions, the rational people will make the decision to get vaccinated. That's been my experience. But you gotta answer the questions. Well, I'd like to thank you all for taking your time to be with us tonight. Catherine, for the good work you're doing every day in your facility. Dr. Hildreth, educating us all. Dr. Reem, taking care of our kids. And Dr. Jahangir. Really appreciate your time. And thank you also to the Grand Ole Opry and the folks out here for sharing their stage and all four Nashville TV stations for sharing the airwaves. Have a good night.